Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the place for all things sci-fi and fantasy with frequent forays into my other favorite topic, history. And that makes sense because that's what steampunk is, historical science fiction. Today I'm going off on a historical tangent to deal with one of the world's first, one of the world's earliest and greatest novels, Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes, the great Spanish author. It was written in two parts by Cervantes in 1610 and 1615. This was before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, Plymouth Rock. He, he was writing when Shakespeare was still alive. I mean, Shakespeare died in 1616, so he was definitely a contemporary of the great bard. Now, we all know the story of Don Quixote. He was a wealthy old aristocrat obsessed by tales of knights and chivalry. Before we get started, though, I'm going to then to uh, pay the bills and uh, promote my own work. Miss Ion D and the Mayan Marvel, written in, written together with my wonderful wife, Mrs. Desperado. And this is a fun steampunk romp uh, in the late 1800s. A uh, young, young heroine, young American heroine, goes to Guatemala with her parents and uh, researches and gets to go to the, the Mayan ruins and investigate some evildoers who are trying to steal artifacts and all that stuff. So it's fun. Check it out. I'll put the uh, link to the Amazon page in the description below. There's an ebook version. There's a physical version. The physical version has illustrations which the ebook does not. So that will make it worth, worth your while to get the, the physical book. So, let's get started. As I said, uh, we know all know the story of Don Quixote. He's a wealthy old aristocrat, a hidalgo, or gentleman as they would say in Spain, obsessed by tales of knights and chivalry, and he begins to believe them. He invents this character, because his name is, is Alonso Quixano, Quixano, I don't know how to say that, and he invents this character, Don Quixote de la Mancha. And he is a knight errant, and he goes on a quest, uh, hiring a poor farmer neighbor as his squire. And he believes in magic. He's always seeing things differently. Windmills become hostile giants, inns become castles, and a homely farm girl who becomes a beautiful princess. And it's given us many images and expressions in our culture. The, the idea of tilting at windmills, which comes from the story, which means jousting with an imaginary enemy. <laughs> And uh, the word quixotic, why it's not pronounced quixotic, I've never known. It should be. And the word lothario, which I will we'll get into later. Even Don Quixote's horse, Rocinante, is immortalized in pieces of fiction. Uh, for example, Rush's sci-fi song, Cygnus X1, and also the sci-fi series, The Expanse, which Rocinante is the, the hero's ship. And it also inspired Dumas from the Three Musketeers to Mark Twain, Edmund Rostand, who wrote Cyrano de Bergerac. Even, uh, even some other stuff, like Terry Gilliam's great movie, The Fisher King, uh, is kind of like a similar Don Quixote-like character uh, played by Robin Williams. So Don Quixote became a musical play called Man of La Mancha uh, back in 1965, which refers to Quixote's home province. And it spawned lots of popular songs like Dream the Impossible Dream. And we will talk a little bit about that later on. I first began reading the book many decades ago when I was in high school. Yes, I think my literature teacher inspired me because we were talking about what was the first novel. And she was talking about this, this English novel called Pamela. But I said, well, wait a minute, wasn't Quixote first? Well, I guess Pamela was the first English novel. But... And that's kind of obscure, so I decided to start reading Don Quixote. And I got discouraged because the, I got into this part where they had this story within a story. And I thought, no, get back to the action. I want to read about Quixote, not this Lothario character. And so, uh, so I abandoned it and came back to it only this year because I've been kind of familiarizing myself with the Western canon. I think... I think a lot of people don't appreciate the, the gifts of Western civilization, 
and I aim to do my part to recognize them. The version I got was a was from Project Gutenberg, which is awesome. You get a lot of free ebooks of, of public domain works, and uh, I will talk about that in another video. All the great titles that you can find on there. It, my version was translated by John Ormsby in 1885. It's considered one of the the singularly best English translations, and there's really some great illustrations in there as well. I thoroughly enjoyed Ormsby's notes about the novel and about the life of Cervantes. And he was a he was a kind of a heroic character, which I will talk about later. Now on the surface, the story of Don Quixote is a satire. It's just a comedy of the romantic books of chivalry that were so popular. Stories like about uh, King Arthur, the French knight Roland. I think some of the real life knights like El Cid and Spain, they would make up these magical stories about them credit them with more than they actually did. They would add dragons and stuff like this. But in the book, the hero, Alonso Quisano, events this character and he cobbles together uh, a suit of armor, uh, saddles up his old horse, he recruits Sancho Panza, one of his neighbors, this kind of simple-minded farmer, and they go on their way. A lot of people try to stop him. They realize he's kind of nuts. <laughs> his niece, who lives with him, his, he's a bachelor, his uh, housekeeper, they're just scandalized, but they can't stop him because he's the boss. And his friends, the barber and the cleric, try to talk him out of it, but they can't. So he, he and uh, Sancho are on their way. Now Sancho is kind of a... I mean, Sancho, on the one hand, he realizes his master is delusional. On the other hand, he wants to believe that, that, that he can actually fulfill his promises because he keeps saying, well, as a knight, I will someday grant you your own island to rule as governor. <laughs> and since Sancho's a poor guy with a wife and, and kids to support, he jumps at the chance. Although, essentially, he's abandoned them for this. He's abandoned them for this uh, for this quest. Anyway, uh, the windmill scene, the famous windmill scene, occurs really early in the book, because uh, Quixote assumes that the windmills are many-armed giants, and he's charged at them with his lance. And of course, the the vein of the windmill knocks him off his knocks him off of his uh, horse, and he's wounded, and and uh, Sancho has to help him up, and he damages his armor. So they go to nurse their wounds at a nearby inn, which, of course, <laughs> uh, Quixote misinterprets as a castle. He thinks the innkeeper is a prince or a king, and he says, you have to dub me as a knight so I can be an official knight. And the innkeeper kind of plays along with him. Because he figures, well, oh, this rich guy, I'll, I'll, I'll humor him. And so these guys just bumble from one misadventure to another. This is like the first part, the first book. And his weird behavior just gets them beat up multiple times. You, you wonder why they don't die <laughs> from all these beatings they get. Poor Sancho, too. Sometimes uh, his impetuousness, sometimes Quixote's impetuousness, injures innocent people. But luckily, he, they, he never kills anyone. <laughs> <laughs> he, he breaks some dude's leg, I know, at one point. And, uh, and uh, by knocking him off his mule or whatever. And the worst thing they do is release a gang of convicts uh, from custody. A lot, and actually, it later costs them. And this guy comes along and steals Don, Sancho's beloved mule, beloved donkey, Dapple. <laughs> I, I, wonder, I wonder if Dapple ever gets anything named after him. Probably not. Anyway, the, the barber and the cleric, they're trying to find him and bring him back home. And that's another funny part of the book where they, they go through all his books, they go through all the, all the guy's books and say, this one, oh, maybe we'll save this one. This one wasn't too bad. And they're kind of, he's kind of, Cervantes is making fun of his fellow writers at the time. And uh, they even joke about Cervantes' own books. They decide to burn most of them and they wall off uh, Alonzo's library so that when he comes back he says what where's my library there's a wall here and I said it was an evil sorcerer did that <laughs> he took your library <laughs> and uh, which I thought was pretty hilarious now the story within the story that I alluded to earlier was called the impertinent curiosity and it's about well it's a story they tell at an inn kind of kind of a pad the pad the book a little bit and it's about this young man, he's very lucky, he has this wonderful, beautiful wife who loves him more than anything, but he doesn't trust her. He wants to test her with his best friend, Lothario. 
who is very charming, and he says, you try to seduce my wife and when I'm not there. <laughs> and, uh, of course, eventually, they, the two fall in love, and uh, the disaster and uh, tragedy ensues. And that's why the name Lothario got to mean what it means. And at the time, at, as a kid, I thought, this is a stupid story. Why would anybody do that? Well, these days, and you know, I think, you know, people are pretty stupid sometimes, so it doesn't, it's not all that far-fetched. So eventually, Quixote returns home at the end of the book, and his friends think he's cured, or he can be cured of his madness. And uh, so book two, which is written like five years later, kind of has a, has a different theme. And the beginning, I love this part, at the beginning, his, his friends test him to see if he's, he's still sane. They, they ask him all these questions, and he gives them very rational answers, very sensible answers. And finally they say, what about the Moors? What are we going to do if they invade Spain again? He says, well, all we have to do is gather up all the world's knights errant, because one knight errant could slay a hundred enemies, so therefore we'll be able to take on the whole Moorish army with these guys. And they said, uh oh, he's still crazy. And so, as it is, as it stands, uh, he and Panza uh, get on their way. And this second book is considered metafiction because, because um, Cervantes keeps referring to this chronicler of uh, Don Quixote, some, uh, some uh, Moorish writer, uh, Mohammed something, who. Uh, who has made it famous, and because of this famous book, everybody knows who Alonzo is in his alter ego, and they're kind of humoring him. They, he's kind of they, he's a bit of a laughing stock, but people enjoy it. So it's kind of cruel. There's this Duke and Duchess that um, have him stay at, have him and Sancho. One of the there's other adventures, but they have him and Sancho stay at their estate, and they invent this crazy adventure. They kind of uh, simulate it while they're blindfolded, like they're supposed to be flying through the air, and it's crazy. And uh, they give Sancho a, an island, <laughs> but it's, it's just a village. It's nowhere near the sea. And so you, you'll be the governor, this village that they're landlords of. And, of course, he botches it terribly, because <laughs> he's illiterate. He's never had any experience with that. Uh, so it's a fun... I enjoyed the second part, I think, a little bit more than the first. The only part I was bummed out about is the ending is very anticlimactic. That it kind of ends with a whimper rather than a bang. I wanted him to go out fighting, and unfortunately he just takes L and dies. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but I think there's a reason for that, I think, which I will address later. Now Cervantes, the left Cervantes is fascinating. He was born to a middle class family. His father was, I believe, was a barber, which in that days also was a surgeon. <laughs> And, uh, but they were frequently in debt. And Cervantes wanted to be a writer from day one. He was an aspiring playwright. His plays just never did as well as Shakespeare's, that's for sure. And uh, he always had to take day jobs to survive. And one of the things he did was he joined the militia to fight the Ottomans, those, those evil Muslims. <laughs> and uh, so he was a brave guy, because he didn't have to go. And he was given his own company of men to command. He was a popular leader, I guess, and he was captured by the Muslims and he was imprisoned in Algiers for five years. The Moorish kings at the time would um, ransom their Christian captives and nobody could raise as much money as the king wanted for Cervantes, so he would organize these escape attempts and they'd always fail. <laughs> And he could have escaped on his own, but he always waited for his comrades. He was very loyal. He was a good guy. Eventually, some duke heard of his plight, and I guess he ransomed a bunch of Christian captives, including Cervantes, and got him back to Spain. Uh, so anyway, the funny thing about uh, the funny thing about uh, the second book of Don Quixote is that it probably wouldn't have been written except that this other writer. This faker wrote a, uh, a story about, wrote an account of a set, part two of Don Quixote, and in it he kind of mocks Cervantes. And I think it's also, I think it's also not considered a very good story. And because of this, he figured, Cervantes figures, well, I have to write part two. And that's, I think, why he killed off, he 
killed off uh, Quixote because he said, I don't want anybody else writing about, about my character. And so and it became a classic, of course. Out of all the stuff he, read, he wrote, this one was, and he's considered a Spanish national hero. A little bit about the play and the movie, Man of La Mancha. It was a 1965 musical uh, with a book by Del Wasserman, music by uh, Mitch Lay, lyrics by Joe Darian. Uh, it was adapted from a teleplay, as they called it back then, in 1959. Uh, it became a movie in 1972, developed directed by Arthur Hiller, United Artists. The, this starred Peter O'Toole as Quixote, uh, James Coco as Sancho, and uh, Sophia Loren as Dulcinea. I finally watched it this year after reading Don Quixote. I just, for whatever reason, I'd never seen it. And whereas the acting's great, the uh, uh, songs are great, what's a little disappointing is the uh, ending. It's so quick. It, it goes so quick through the life of Quixote. It's, um, it is actually, what it is, is it's a, it's a fictionalized account of Cervantes being as a playwright and director with a traveling troupe, he gets arrested for the Inquisition for blasphemous works. And uh, while he's in prison awaiting trial, he, he and his assistant, uh, James Coco, <laughs> uh, they play, they reenact the play of Don Quixote with some of the prisoners, which is, which is kind of fun. Again, it just, it just ends too soon. Uh, O'Toole and Coco are great, and Sophia Loren is lovely as Dulcinea. And so the funny thing about that is, of course, in real life, Cervantes never gotten in trouble with the Inquisition. He did, uh, he was in trouble, he was arrested, or it was an arrest warrant for a duel he fought, and there was a, um, he was also briefly imprisoned. He was accused of, of uh, fraud, he was a tax collector, I guess they thought he was skimming <laughs> up revenue, revenues. But uh, never anything with the Inquisition. It's got the germ of truth here is that Cervantes and his family were most likely what was called New Christians. Now that meant essentially that they were Jews. They were descended from Jews who had converted to Christianity at the at the uh, command of the king. And uh, a lot of them practiced Judaism secretly, which was what which was the they, these people were the major targets of the Inquisition. Oh my God! They're secretly celebrating Yom Kippur, <laughs> and we have to root them out. They're not real Christians. And again, there's no, there was no evidence that uh, Cervantes' family ever got in trouble. But it's interesting that Sancho, in the book, keeps referring to himself as an old Christian, which means he's a genuine Christian. He's not one of those Jews that's just pretending to be a Christian. No, <laughs> he's a genuine Catholic, and. Uh, so I think Cervantes was poking fun in that, in that uh, sense. So as far as why people, why people love the story so much, well, at first it was just a comedy. It was just a just fun comedy for, hundred, for a couple hundred years. People considered it that and the, only that. And then, you know, with all the serious revolutions, like the French Revolution and the American Revolution, these great thinkers started saying, this book is symbolic. It means that a man can be sane, and society is mad. <laughs> well, I guess the French society did kind of go mad during the Revolution, didn't they? Uh, and uh, later on, they said, "Well, it's because society has rendered him mad by by making his ideals of chivalry obsolete." Nowadays, it's just considered part of the canon, part of one of the greatest books ever ever written, and I consider it to be one of those. Uh, I tend towards the, the former interpretation, though. Uh, I don't think Cervantes meant it to be that deep. I think he wanted to be a popular writer. I think he wouldn't make money, just like Shakespeare really, really wanted to, wanted to be a working playwright. And uh, people put in those interpretations later. Uh, but uh, like I was saying with uh, Watership Down in a previous video, I think sometimes the writer has these ideas in the back of his mind, and they sneak into the work even though they're, they're not intended to be like that. As far as rating, I would give Don Quixote four and a half years. I know, I know, that's almost blasphemy. But uh, 
in my mind, the deficiencies were the story within a story, which kind of stops the action, and the fact that its ending is kind of disappointing. So, this has been my review of the classic novel Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes, written in 1610 and 1615. Please let me know what you think about this in the space below. Please like and subscribe so we can continue to get out the good word about steampunk and classics like these that are sadly neglected in the current age. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.